Um, today I'm going to be talking about nine keys to a successful maker program in a school. <clears throat> um, this was supposed to be a live webinar, um, but due to technical difficulties we had to pre slash post record it. Uh, so hopefully you're enjoying uh, the video on YouTube and we want to make sure to be able to answer any questions you have. So feel free to leave them in the comments section below. We will try to answer them as quickly as possible for you. So one of the first keys to a wonderful and exciting and rich maker classroom is the idea to make first, teach later. And what we mean by this is that you get buy-in from your students first. Get them exploring and playing with the materials and the tools that you have on hand. Now this is not playing in an unsafe sense. Um, but more of something along the lines of starting to play with their imagination and build with cardboard, maybe cut some corners for them in terms of if you're, if you're teaching electronics, you're not using a current limiting resistor uh, with an LED. You're not even telling them what a current limiting resistor is. Um, this is things like just spending time playing with Lego bricks and elements, building something out of cardboard, uh, taking things apart. A couple of wonderful products to explore in this area of making first teaching later is the Makey Makey. So if you don't know any, if you haven't seen the Makey Makey before, it is a, a circuit board that emulates <clears throat> your keyboard and mouse inputs and you can connect anything that conducts electricity even in the slightest way uh, to it and once you complete a circuit between earth or ground and the the arrow keys or the spacebar and mouse bo button click keys uh, it will actually happen on your computer so your students can start to build really really interesting inputs in your computer for your their computers uh, without even knowing exactly what a circuit is and then that gives you the context to jump in and explain what a circuit is and even go beyond that and, and start to explore what is a series circuit versus a parallel circuit and and even conductivity you know that that us as humans actually conduct a little bit of electricity through our bodies so you can actually play you can use each other a high five as, as a switch paper circuits is an un, another wonderful way to jump in and just explore and build with basic circuit concepts without um, without having to dive too deeply. So one of the things that we build is this wonderful uh, badge with a robot and there's an LED behind it and students build the circuit out of copper tape and it lights up the LED behind the robot making it light up. <clears throat> uh, one thing that we also really, really promote in, in terms of the uh, maker aspect and just electronics exploration is taking things apart, having your students bring in cheap old electronics and not smashing them to bits and to take them apart, but methodically and uh, take, a, take them apart with screwdrivers, uh, lay them out, take pictures this is called uh, a teardown. Uh, so this is a teardown of an older cell phone and lay out the parts and start to explore what those parts are, what they do, how they work, and even start to do what we call some circuit bending with that, which is what happens when I connect this wire to this wire? Now sometimes it, when, it, there's, when it's powered, <clears throat> sometimes you'll let the magic blue smoke out. Sometimes it will cause the cell phone to ring or do different things. So. There's, a, there's a lot of electronics out there that the voltage is low enough and things like that that you can actually start to play around and tinker with the circuit itself without uh, hurting a student. Uh, it, it will, again, let out. It might fry the electronics, but that's part of the fun in exploring it and, and making first and teaching later. You can then go back. It'll cause them to ask questions, and that's the main thing is that making first causes students to come up with questions that then you can teach too, rather than assuming that these students are going to have these these questions in their head already. Uh, so it allows you to set some context for what you want to teach uh, and go from there. 
The next point is do not overthink or oversell making in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times we, we see an ov almost an over-romancing of the maker movement in the classroom and that every school needs to have a, a maker space and a maker lab. And if I don't, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, and that is not the case at all. Uh, the, the, anybody from social studies to math through science to music can be making in the classroom. The act of sure being doing a hands-on activity um, is making something. And I, I remember uh, when I was in elementary school in my music classroom, uh, one of the times we made a, a fife, a flute, out of um, some leftover bamboo. Right? We hot glued this thing together. We cut them to the length. Everything sounded horrible, but we built these musical instruments ourselves. And that is making in the classroom. Now, teachers have been doing this for years, but somehow uh, in kind of the, the mantra of commercializing things, it, it's become over-romanced. And so don't think about it too hard. Don't try to oversell it. Just do what you've been doing naturally and, and kind of always be thinking in, your, in, your, in terms of, am I asking my students to build something with their hands? Is there a way for me to implement a, a physical artifact around what I'm trying to teach my students? Uh, can I teach my students through, in fact, design of a physical artifact? And are they thinking and, thinking and talking in the ideas of, form versus function. Am I focusing on my students building something functional or literally just an, an interesting aesthetic or an interesting look? It's a beautiful. Um, I'm, they're trying to build something that's scary, for example. Uh, are my students iterating? Am I focusing my, my teaching on the, the act of iterating and designing over and over and over again and improving a design? versus a final product. And I don't care how my students get there. Uh, basically process versus final final product. Am I focusing, and this, this happens more in shop class, but the, the idea of high quality craft versus a them learning a specific concept. Craft being, you know, the most beautifully sanded, smooth, glossy finish on some type of tabletop or whatever their carved piece of wood is. Um, this could even be like a, a 3D printed object that is, they just did an amazing job and it's nice and smooth. Um, and there's no um, errors in the print versus the conceptual side of things where I'm not focusing on the quality of the of the product itself, but focusing on the quality of their ideas. And both of these, all of these have their own camps and uh, points of importance in the maker culture for the classroom. Um, there's also the idea of students using what they built as either, either a tool or a material, right? So. Uh, for example, an Arduino project could be used as a tool to study the, the effect of sunlight in a room in terms of temperature. So that's using what they built as a tool versus them using these electronics as a material, a creative material to build something more aesthetically pleasing, such as a, um, a light sculpture, for example. So there's these two, there's always this duality between different ideas and, and as an instructor and a teacher, you can actually put to words what you're looking for in, in terms of these dualities. One of the things that we talk about in, in terms of, um, especially when you start making the classroom, there's, there's a tendency to want to jump to a 3D printer, want to jump to the expensive, the fun toys, the exciting things that students always want to jump go to. But when we look at, again, these dualities of form versus function or iteration versus final, uh, craft versus concept and tools versus materials, the 3D printer is not always the answer. Sometimes it is literally just an X-Acto knife, some colored pencils, hot glue, and your students will actually get more out of the, the experience of being able to de design and build four different versions of their project in cardboard 
than the time it would take them to print a single 3D print uh, on the 3D printer. This also allows for scale. So imagine a 3D print taking about an hour. That means in a classroom of 30, it would take 30 hours of printing to make sure that every student had enough time or had enough time to print one finished product. Whereas you can see if it was cardboard, they can just all be building at the same time and uh, the sky's the limit in terms of the amount of time it takes for them to iterate on their project. So again, the main thing is that we focus on what is the main goal in the, our, for our students? Is it a final finished product versus a very iterative process and a rough process? Teachers must visibly practice their craft. And this goes for if you're an English teacher, if you're a science teacher, a PE teacher, you need to be practicing your craft in front of your students. They need to see you doing the things that they're learning to do in your classroom. One of my favorite people to watch and to learn from is Adam Savage because he literally, um, especially in, his, in the new series, if you watch um, Tested, which is his, his web video series, uh, his one day builds, you could sit there and watch him all day long because he is literally teaching you how to do something through the act of building uh, over the course of a day. So I would much rather have you as a teacher be somebody like Adam Savage. And, and again, this is your own craft. So if you are a poet, you should be writing and sharing poetry with your students. Um, your desk should not look like the one on the right. You should be actively participating in your classroom. So if you teach technology, have a bunch of projects out on your desk. Uh, when I taught middle school, I would constantly have half finished projects out on my desk. Uh, some robots. I was one, one student brought in an Xbox and asked me to modify it for him. So I did. And that project was sitting out on the desk for half, half, half a week or so. And what that caused was students to engage with me as a peer in building uh, and engage their curiosity and I was somebody safe that they can ask questions about in terms of what's happening and show me how this is and a lot of times it was hey can you fix this for me my phone's not working or whatever it just it it brought the to the forefront of their attention uh, versus looking at a big pile of papers to that's waiting to be graded I just seemed like any other teacher to them um, whereas if I'm personally invested in what they're doing in my classroom. Uh, I am seen more as a peer to them uh, that they can ask advice from rather than a teacher, so to say. Uh, one of the things that's really important in the, the maker community and the, I would say the maker classroom specifically is the idea of building an ecology of tools and materials in your classroom. I think a lot of teachers go about this the wrong way sometimes and they can do a better job of it. And I think a lot of times us as uh, product manufacturers can do a better job of providing this for teachers as well, or providing guidance specifically, in that um, you want, as a teacher, you want all of your things in your classroom to build on one another. Right. The last thing you want to do is say, hey, we're going to program this thing called a Sphero for a week. And then we're going to jump to this next thing for a week. And then we're going to go program something in Scratch for a week. And then we're going to go build something out of cardboard for a week. And it becomes disjointed and things don't flow from one thing to the other. What you want is the lessons learned from week one to inform the lessons on week four, then to inform the lessons in week 18 whatever you want to call it. One of the best examples that we have at SparkFun provided is an ecosystem of products around the micro bit. Um, if you want to learn more about the micro bit, we did a, I actually did a previous uh, webinar, uh, I think about two weeks ago, you can go to our, the webinar webpage to, to view that, uh, that kind of how the micro bit works together. But what we did is we built a number of breakout boards and kits around it so that if you have a micro bit in your classroom, you can actually build circuits with it. So breadboarding and do the kind of formal electronics thing. But you can also build a robot with it. 
You could build a weather station with it with the weather station kit. You could even build a video game and video game controller with it using the, the arcade kit. So it is one product, actually it's multiple products that all work together around the micro bit. And there, we're hoping to have more and more products like this for the classroom so that if you are a teacher, you can invest in micro bits and then know that there are a number of avenues to explore going with your classroom and your students in the future. Um, the last, like I said, the last thing we want is for you to buy a bunch of these things and most of them sit on the shelf for weeks, if not years on end until you finally come back around to them. Um, this also, the idea of an ecosystem allows your students to explore on their own a little bit more. Maybe you do some direct instruction with your students for a week or so, and then you say, here are these different areas for you to explore with the micro bit. If you want to do robotics, there's some robotics kits over there. If you want to go build a weather station, there's a weather station kit over there. And then it allows students to self-identify with whatever they want to do. If they want to build something on their own, they can just use the kit and use the electronics on their own. So it's not driving all of the students to do exactly the same thing on the exact timing and all that stuff. So again, look for products that work within an ecosystem of your classroom. Whether your classroom is Lego based, uh, micro bit based, Arduino based, whatever it is, even if it's not electronics, do these things work together and how do you envision them working together if they are not necessarily software or hardware driven? Um, so that's one thing to be sure of is, you know, don't keep throwing things at your students and hope things stick, but uh, give them a good flow, workflow to, to work through in terms of the products that you're using in your classroom. This is one of my favorite. Um, code is a material to make with, and it should be treated as such. Um, the important thing here is a, a lot of uh, computer science lessons are taught without context in a lot of ways. Um, I love the idea of, of Hour of Code, but I, I think one of the things that it lacks is that the Hour of Code actually doesn't give context to students why they are programming. Not only that, but also what they can truly do with their programming skills. It teaches programming and it teaches computational thought process, which is amazing. And, and uh, I think it's, it's a huge step in the right direction. But what I do think is that what can I actually do with these skills is, is the big question that is still lacking. So whether I'm programming in Scratch or Arduino or in JavaScript, um, or programming the micro bit in, in make Microsoft make code, what am I actually doing with this? What what am I accomplishing? What are what are the goals for me to build? And, and it's not even um, to f build a physical thing, but because you can build plenty of things in the in the digital world, the digital landscape with software and writing code. It's just that students a lot of times, especially with the, the, the short term self guided programming lessons, they don't see that. Uh, they see whether they made a robot go from one side of the screen to the other, but in reality, what the, the language they're learning allows them to do so much more in the real world. We want to make sure that we make that connection solid because that's what's going, what's what will inspire uh, the students moving forward into a STEM or STEAM career. Um, shameless plug here. Um, two books that are actually really strong and actually they, they um, stem from classroom practices, uh, both from the Arduino side of things with the, the Arduino's Inventor, Arduino Inventor's Guide, uh, which is 10 different Arduino projects that, allow, that bring context. So not only electronics, how do I program electronics, but how do I then add cardboard and a lot of these craft materials to, to the mix and to give those projects a reality that you don't normally get from a breadboard and raw, raw electronics or standard electronics. 
A um, couple of projects in there is a cardboard balance beam that moves back and forth and you can control it. Uh, a miniature greenhouse. Uh, my favorite is the world's worst monitor, which is nine pixel monitors, nine LEDs. Um, so there's a number of really interesting projects in that book. Uh, they all could be used as a, a rough outline for um, classroom projects. Again, they came from the classroom for the most part. The SparkFun Guide to Processing is the same concept, but on the software side of things, creating art uh, using the processing language, very similar to Arduino, text-based programming language uh, based on Java. And what it is, is it's creating digital art on your computer screen. Um, there's a couple of instances where we do pull some hardware out and, and play around with processing, but most of it can be done for free using the processing IDE. Again, both of these software-wise are free. Uh, the Arduino Inventor's Guide does take hardware um, to be able to do it, but uh, most of, I'd probably say, 12 of the 13 chapters in the, the SparkFun Guide to Processing can be done without any hardware whatsoever. Um, so. Both of those books are really good places to start your students on, again, uh, software application and learning to program with, with that context in mind. Uh, making is a mindset, not a defined curriculum. Uh, I think if anybody tells you that there is a specific maker curriculum or making curriculum, I, I hate to say it, but I... I I would have an, a significant argument with them um, around that um, because I think making, like I said before, making can be brought into any curriculum. Uh, it's a mindset. It's not here, you know, draw here, cut there, uh, but it's something to be integrated into uh, with your classroom. If you're looking to integrate making into your classroom, there's two things that I would look into. Um, wonderful book by Sir Sylvia Martinez and Gary Steger, Invent to Learn. And again, this is very much pedagogy base. Um, so if you're looking for how to change your practice as a teacher towards learning and bringing invention into your classroom without necessarily teaching a specific curriculum, uh, this book is something that I've gone through multiple copies of and I, I can't keep it because I keep giving it away to people in the airport and at workshops and different things like that. So highly, highly recommend this book. I think a new uh, version of the book is coming out pretty soon. Uh, so check out Amazon. Uh, we also sell it at, at, on our site, SparkFun. Uh, also, if you're looking for, you're like, hey, I want to do this thing, but I don't really, I can't think of any activities on my own. There's plenty of, you know, you can always Google uh, maker activities for XYZ, but uh, Inventor Space, invent.sparkfun.com is a great place to look at activities that use um, a lot of our hardware, use a lot of the things that we've talked about, I've talked about previously here. Um, but it's just a place where teachers have uploaded lesson plans and things that they've done, lesson plans that we've come up with. So it's becoming a repository of lesson plans. So if you wanted to implement something with the Makey Makey, uh, there's a good lesson plan there that you can start. And then if you feel like you just nailed the thing, you can actually upload your lesson plan uh, to Inventor Space and, and help out the next teacher. I also include um, a bit.ly link there on just the maker mindset in, in the classroom. It's a wonderful, wonderful article to read. So, so check that article out as well. The word hack needs to be part of the everyday vocabulary of the classroom. Uh, I think for the majority of teachers, when they hear the word hack, it, it uh, brings up negative connotations. You know, they think of uh, a kid with a black hoodie on with the hood up, hacking, in, hacking into the school system to change their grades, or you know, the proverbial uh, guy in a van asking for a minute so that you know, he can disable some type of security system for his buddy robbing a bank. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. The word hack literally just means to use something for an, another use that's not, it wasn't originally intended for. We've all hacked something. I don't know how many times that I have opened a can with 
a screwdriver um, or use the hammer the hundreds of wrong ways that it's supposed to be used. Um, you know, rolling up a piece of paper and, and picking your teeth with it is hacking a piece of paper. It's it Hacking is just, again, being inventive with the materials that you have to accomplish a task. One of the things that you can look into at, at different scales in your classroom is the hack mindset. And this is all from um, the Stanford D School. So the, the growth hacker mindset uh, and the, the hack mindset is how do I change my classroom practices? How do I even change my school, you know, bigger picture of the school practices to the hacker mindset? Uh, and you can spend an entire webinar and series and the, the, the D-School actually offers an, a number of professional developments around it. I highly recommend them. Um, but the, the main three things is bias to action. You know, let's stop talking about what we're going to do and just do it. Uh, don't overthink it, just go try. Fail forward and learn. So the idea of f failure is not a bad thing, but we're using failures as opportunities to learn. What did we learn from this? How do we pivot to something new and, and fail forward? We're still moving forward. If that didn't work, let's try something new. And then start small. Uh, I think a lot, this is the biggest pitfall for a lot of uh, schools and classrooms that pick up hacking and making in the classroom is that they aim for the $20,000 or $100,000 grant. And when they get it, they automatically spend it on the expensive toys and um, we're just going to go all in on this. And where the thing is, if you start small, if you start with some cardboard and an X-Acto knife and you get your students into this, they will demand those tools at a, at a given cadence in time and they will solve problems at a faster clip of time. If you start small and you get some wins under your belt, uh, for them, you know, whether it is how do we make this classroom less breezy for an older older building, school building, or how can we change the flow of the pattern of the hallways to make it more efficient during passing time? Those are things that have meaning to the students. They're actually rather small problems for them, um, or sm small problems to solve, I should say. So keep the goal small, uh, the team tight, and the timeline short. Last thing you want to do with students is give them an entire term to solve, you know, how do we build a better recycling bin? It just, it, there's, it's slow and they lose focus and they lose drive where if you tell them you're going to build, design and build an, um, the new recycling bin of the future in the next class period, you get them moving and thinking in a different clip and it, it actually works out better for them. So, more problems, action-oriented, fail forward, and start small. Uh, a good product to look at when you want to get students hacking things and building, um, you know, improving products, is take a look at our SparkFun Inventors Kit. Um, it, it allows, it gives your students enough electronic components and knowledge and experience that then they can take this kit and go, what can I do now? You know, can I measure the temperature in the refrigerator? Yes, you can. Can I make it, make this little thing print out what the temperature in the refrigerator is? Yes, you can over an LCD screen. So now students can start exploring and modifying things with legitimate electronics on their own and really bringing to the forefront their imagination. A maker classroom should not exist in a vacuum. Um, and what this, what I'm, what we're talking about with this, is that there are a lot of professions out there that, from an engineer to a chef uh, to an auto mechanic, that are all bring different things to the table when it comes to making the classroom and thought process and problem solving and design. Bring those people into your classroom. Bring them in, bring your students into their world, whether it is through a, a, a Skype session or a Google Hangout, whether they come as a guest speaker, 
the best thing would be to how do we involve our students project with a professional real world problem uh, one of the ways that we've done this in the in the past and we are currently doing now is we are running what are called makeathons and the makeathon is the concept of bringing in an industry professionals bringing in teachers and bringing in students to all to learn together during one day and then solve problems with the with the skills and knowledge that they gained so we've done this with Arduino before we've done this with a micro bit before we've done this with JavaScript before with 20 of each of those groups they make up teams and in, in the morning they spend time basically going through a workshop learning how to build circuits how to program hardware they have a working lunch where they are given uh, different tasks or challenges to accomplish and then the afternoon they go through and they build uh, a number of different projects prototype them by the end of the day similar to how you would see as a, prof in a professional hackathon and then they present them to their peers at the end of the day and uh, I want to share this video with you here in a second uh, this is from um, Yamhill County Makeathon in Oregon. Uh, the, where we've been doing a number of them with the Innovate Oregon nonprofit. So I'll, let, I'll play this and let you uh, see it. My favorite part of the day is always the first person to always see that LED blink and we call it the hello world moment. We had uh, a lot of fun and in, in my, my case would be the interaction with uh, a new learner and I guess such a good student uh, for, for a kids. Um, expanding his knowledge is, is my joy to see um, him learn more and more and uh, learn rapidly. I think the best part of today has been um, watching the partnerships between the kids and the adults um, because their co-learning that's happening. I think um, seeing the students and the adults on a level playing field and um, being able to help each other learn, be creative, and um, solve these problems together. I think it's just showing each other that they both have a lot of things that they can give to one another. My favorite part of the day was uh, just getting to meet new people. I, um, My partners that I'm doing this project with are really great and it's uh, been really cool to get to know them. Um, my favorite part of the day is probably collaborating with everyone because it's just nice to hear everybody. I've had fun because it's fun to solve problems and learn new things. But it's not like really learning, it's fun. It's not boring because we get to have hands on and not just sitting there. I had a blast today. I, th I didn't expect to have as much fun as I did. We've had a lot of laughing and, and just uh, when things work right and when they don't work right, uh, um, but just that uh, working together has really been a fun uh, day for everyone. I like hearing other people's ideas and sharing my ideas with them. I had a lot of fun. I was just telling my group there's no way I would have known how to do any of this uh, this morning. Uh, but we just made a happy Valentine's Day reader sign and that was really cool. <laughs> So yeah, um, run a makeathon today in your community. Have that as a as a kickoff to to making in your classroom. If you're starting a makerspace, have it you know use this that concept as a uh, kickoff for that space, and just have fun doing it. Um, a lot of these students are were <clears throat> rural students, so some of the the projects were how to do an automated chicken coop. So they had to have the problem of how do I know if it's day or night? I need to be able to close the close and open the door. How do I know when a chicken's inside the chicken coop? And a lot of these students were able to solve these problems all on their own in a day of learning, programming, 
circuit building and then going and using those what they learned to prototype that uh, another one was how do i keep my uh, my pump house warm a lot of these kids live out where they have a well and and freezing pipes is a legitimate problem so so those are some of the the project prompts that we we gave them and then depending on where you live and your students culture there might be other project prompts that you can think of the last one is money doesn't grow on trees, but you don't have to wait until it does. And the, the idea of cardboard and hot glue is something that you can do that's really cheap, that your students can iterate with, uh, that they can integrate electronics when you have electronics. They can integrate color and, and a lot of different things into that. So the, the idea is just to get started and start small and just to get the thing, get the ball rolling. And then you get, um, you, you might have a little bit of budget one year to buy some electronics. You might have a little bit of budget to buy a, a smaller, cheap 3D printer. Maybe a robot of some kind. Then look at grants. Uh, a lot of your school districts have foundation grants that you can apply for every year that are in that $2,000 to $5,000 range, which is perfect to spend on, on a 3D printer and some of those bigger t tools. The idea is just get going first, have goals. One, one of the things that I would learn when I was teaching was managing a makerspace is like running a business. You need to have a long-term goal and a way to prove that you can do this in a sustainable way to your principal and leadership in your school. Uh, a lot of times things like this sink or swim depending on is it sustainable or not? Am I going to be able to get funding next year for this? And I built, literally built a business plan, a five-year business plan for my lab to be able to talk to my principal and say, here's my goal. Here's how I'm going to achieve it through the, try, I mean, for these specific grants, through the budget you've given me, this is a sustainable way of doing this. If it is not sustainable and I'm getting, dipping into the red, what are the ways that you can raise money to keep it sustainable? And one of those could be an um, electronics bake sale or students are selling projects. A lot of, a lot of schools in the area that I live in actually they build and sell Adirondack chairs, uh, picnic tables, sheds, uh, skateboards. So they, one of them has, they have, they make their own laminated skateboard. So some of these things have an initial investment, but then they, they, they start to support themselves in terms of an income. Uh, if you have a vinyl cutter at school, a CNC vinyl cutter, you can actually start making stickers to sell at the student store. So there's a number of these things that the, that the maker lab or, or maker classroom actually enables for you to make it self-sustaining and actually pay for itself in the long run, if not pay for more in the long run. So again, these were, these were just nine thoughts that I had from my experience in the classroom as well as my time at SparkFun so far. Uh, again, I, I hope they, they speak into your classroom practice and that I've given you a couple ideas to think about. If you have any questions, again, please uh, add them to the, the comment section of uh, the YouTube video. We'll try to answer them as quickly as possible. Uh, again, this is the wrap-up of the webinar series, so if you have any questions on any of the other videos, Feel free to leave comments, and uh, hopefully it's not the last series to come from us. So thank you so much for watching, and we will talk to you later.